Yeah. Um. Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're here yeah, with Bill Cunningham. Hi. The VN so cool. of VIP with us today. <laughs> 100%. As folks are rolling in, we invite you to say hi in the chat. Tell us where you're from. That's always, we're always curious about that. And today is June 21st, the first day of summer and my grandma's birthday. I got to call her later. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious to know what the beginning of summer means to you. For example, I'll start. I was sitting on the porch here in Marion, North Carolina, where I'll be for the next two months on this residency, drinking my coffee. And I heard the summer's very first cicada at least my very first cicada for the summer. And that's when I was like, oh, summer has started. And then turns out it actually had started, but. <laughs> so where you're from and what summer means to you, for me, it'd be cicadas. Heidi, how about you? What's summer to you? Speaking of insects, um, <laughs> me and Zach were just teaching together in Madeline Island and he got to see me in my whole beekeeper style mosquito net with raincoats so I don't get bit through my clothes. So when it's truly summer, I stay inside with the air conditioning and I quilt because it is the only season that I complain about freely. The rest of the year, I have no complaints. <laughs> Heidi, if you ever wondered how good of friends we are, just go back to that moment on Madeline Island when I walked beside you in the beekeeper outfit. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, this is my friend. This is my friend. Yeah. I love my friend. There we go. I'll add a photo of it to my PowerPoint for day, today, just so everyone <laughs> can understand the love that you have. <laughs> Madeline <laughs> Island is the place to teach. Isn't that a blast there? It's beautiful. I would suggest maybe not when we were in June because there were so many ticks. But oh, um, right. In October, when I was there um, most recently, it was gorgeous, just completely beautiful. I didn't have one single bug problem. The mushrooms were every color on the forest floor. So gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was there in September. I'll be there in September again this year. Uh, and what knocked me out was that I could go swimming in Lake Superior. Uh, that was a first uh, for me. I'm not used to super cold water swimming and uh, it was not super cold. It's amazing. I don't know what would cause it would that. would be like chef's kiss. That's gotta be the time to go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's cold. You know, Nicole loves uh, the the beach here, but it's, it's never warm enough for me. I would swim if it was warm enough, but she's out there splashing, it's cold. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm with Marsha here in the chat saying being outdoors, watermelon and summer fruit, farmer's market stuff. I feel like that's sort of the, the thing that's like summer in my brain. It's just like, you know, sitting on the porch, eating just whatever fruit, you know, watermelon, spitting seeds, having a speed, a seed spitting contest for sure. <laughs> Uh, for me, it's the return. It, it's the light. Uh, uh, um, I think I was made to live in Scandinavia in the summertime. Anyway, I, I, I don't, I've just been more sensitive the last few years to the disappearance of the light in the fall and to the reappearance in the spring. I feel like I'm coming alive, and to, so today I'm the most fully alive mm. all year. <laughs> Yeah, this is the longest day of the year, the most sunlight we're ever going to get. We're enjoying it today. Yeah, yeah. So I hope you have good late night plans. That sun's going to be setting here on the East Coast around 9.30-ish, 9-ish, pretty late. Well, folks, what do you say we go ahead and get to cracking? Let's do, we'll do some quick introduction in case this is your first time with us. If you are, a special welcome to you. I'm Zach Foster. I am from North Carolina, currently residing in Brooklyn, New York. 18 year Spanish teacher, but now full-time artist as of last fall. And I'm a bit of a tumbleweed. I'm in my 10 year old Honda rolling up and down the East Coast, bouncing from one residency, one friend's house to the next. That's me. 
and I'm Heidi Parks. I live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I do a lot of hand quilting. Um, just last night, I was part of a mentorship program. I got to meet all the potential mentees with the Milwaukee Artist Resource Network. Mm. Felt like an amazing milestone of being a mentor instead of an up and coming. Mm. And I do a lot of teaching on Zoom, teaching in person. And I've got some quilts that are still up at the Iowa Quilt Museum. I just went live with our friend Amanda Nadig to share about that today. Luke? Oh, well, I'm Luke. I live in Los Angeles now. Uh, and sort of, speaking of summer stuff, I'm trying our first garden. It's not our first garden, but it's our first real garden. And so we are swimming in zucchini. Everything else seems to be angry. We might have one and a half okra, but we've got zucchini, so. <laughs> I'm one fifteenth successful, so that's all right. Um, I'm a quilt maker primarily. I do teach about once a month on Zoom, um, but otherwise I'm showing quilts all over the world. Used to go with them, but since COVID, I mostly just stick them in boxes and see, you know, see pictures from afar, <laughs> uh, which is still pretty fun. It's still pretty fun to pepper the world with quilts. Um, the more recent projects is actually just putting them in the world for free, so that's going to be what I'm working on uh, more coming into the summer. Joe? Oh, uh, I'm Joe Cunningham. Uh, I've been making quilts um, for, 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 for 43 years now uh, for a living. And um, uh, yeah, I get to show quilts all over. I teach online. I have uh, what I call the Quilt Freedom Workshop, which is my monthly uh, uh, quilt class <laughs> and uh, uh, I get to show quilts everywhere and uh, uh, I write about them and I talk about them uh, and I drive people crazy uh, around me talking about quilts all the time and I'm very happy to be here thanks you guys super happy to have you and Joe you don't have to worry about driving us crazy that's what we're here for <laughs> all right we'll don't talk about back. quilts that's yeah 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 everyone is here for that's right, all right. that's right Okay, well, folks, let's jump in. Today, I'm going to share a little bit about my residency project, this homecoming series. I have no idea what Heidi, Luke, and Joe have in store, but I'm sure it's something good. Um, Heidi, am I spotlighted? Is it just me? Are we well, ready to go? Well, four of us are spotlighted, so you can okay. you can screen share, or are you just hold yeah. it up. Okay, perfect. No, I'm gonna screen share. I'm gonna screen share. Perfect. All right, so. You probably, yeah, I've been sharing this on Instagram this week. I have like this whole like week long series of posts queued up and ready to share with you, telling you the story of homecoming. But there are certain stories that can't be told in Instagram posts. Someone tells some of them today. But then there are certain stories I can't even tell you here because I, at, at this present point in time, I can't interact with the quilt. This is a interactive quilt series I'm about to tell you about. So I'll tell you as much as I can. Here we go. I have spent, as many of you know, the last five months in, Western North Carolina at a folk school called John C. Campbell Folk School. I was her first artisan residence, which was an honor and a pleasure all mine. And I proposed making a series of three homecoming quilts, which would examine my evolving, shifting relationship between me and my home state of North Carolina. And so the first quilt, the idea was the excitement of leaving home in 2008 right, for New York City. Then the middle quilt was going to be after having been in the new place for a while, settled in your routine, those moments where you start missing home. And the last quilt is the homecoming because God will, in the next few months, I will be moving back to North Carolina. And so that's a basic idea. That was what I proposed to them. And that's essentially what happened. But as I lived and inhabited and resided in that part of North Carolina called Cherokee County, North Carolina, it became um, un unseeable that there were very, very few Cherokee folks around this area that was named after them. And I couldn't shake the idea of the privilege inherent in being able to mm, cast my journey in my relationship to my home into these quilts without also just acknowledging that that's I've had a pretty sweet situation in a lot of ways, right? I've been able to gallivant up and down the East Coast at whim in a lot of ways. And so 
what started as an autobiographical project still was an autobiographical project. It just got a new layer on it. And so that's what I'd like to show you now. So there are three quilts in this series, like I told you. The original quilt is hanging in the back and each quilt has its own veil. You can see a veil here. There's a veil on the second one and a veil on the third one. The brown part has a tree on it. That was an awesome shower curtain that I found in a thrift shop. And when I saw they had three trees and I knew I was thinking about place and I was thinking about land, it just seemed so natural to cut it into thirds and include it in this veil. There are also in each piece, pieces from my grandma's stash, my 106 year old grandma. And that was important to me because what I wanted to happen with these veils was not so much to obscure the work, they do eventually come off, but I wanted to try to create some kind of um, set apart space that people could step into that might give them a sense of what I was thinking about being a white person returning home to Cherokee land and thinking about home. So I was trying to create this experience. And so the veils, I instructed people, we had our big opening, folks came into the, to the room. And I said, folks, here's what these quilts are about, just like I told you. Here's what I want you to do with them. I want you to grab a hold of the veil and I want you to lift it up to take a closer look. And that's it. And then we came back around about 20 or 30 minutes later and talked about it. But here's a short video. There's all three together. Here's a short video showing you how people were participating in this. And for the most part, it went just like I had planned. People were holding these things up, creating this canopy, casting this shadow, engaging in some kind of personal way with this experience that I've been having for the last several months, these reflections that I've been doing. It was important to me to include pieces from my grandmother's stash. Like that's one of her scars on the bottom that you see there with the brown and blue flowers. Not to say that of course my, my ever loving grandma is, is, is like guilty of this, but there, it is to say that as a white person who is descended from white settlers in the area, that is forever a part of my family history story, right? And so I wanted to show some kind of personal involvement and in using my grandma's fabric seemed a, a natural way to do that. So with the veils lifted, the first quilt that you see here, all three of these quilts were reconstructed from vintage quilt tops. I got from various people, various places. And I was looking to, when I was thinking about home, tap into what felt in a lot of ways like archetypal stories, right? That people generally love their home. Um, people generally have experiences about missing home at some point in their life. And so tapping into using these older quilts felt like I was also able to show that in a sense. And so that's why I started with these, these vintage patchwork quilts. Here you see, I chose this one because it has pinwheels on it. So in 2008, I was young and I was in love. And now I'm a little more of one and a little less of the other. I'll let you sort that one out. And so I decided to make this bright, spinny pinwheel quilt. So it reminded me of chakras and moving energy. There are stars that are up top, you know, bright and glitzy. It was hand tied because one of the conversations I have with my good friend Heidi was that every part of the quilt can tell another facet of the story. And so one of the things we were thinking about is, well, how can I tell the story of home through quilting? And so <clears throat> in this particular quilt, I chose hand ties with bright orange acrylic yarn that I thrifted because it was like fireworks, it was exciting, you know, it was fast, it was, it was happening, you know. So a couple of detail shots for you. Here's a log cabin that I got from my friend Beverly Smith. This is the same set of log cabins that you often see me wear on my hoodie, if you remember those. I applicate some pieces on top. There's some gold pieces for the glitz and the glamour, the big lights of the big city. And there's a star, which I'll come back to towards the end of my time. Is backed with Thomas the Tank Engine fabric, not because I'm a big Thomas, I mean, I am a Thomas fan, I think I can, you know, but really it was just beautiful colors. It's what I needed to see on that, you know, quarter inch of trim all the way around the quilt. Mm -hmm. Now quilt number two is after I've 
been in North Carolina, after I've been in New York, excuse me, for a while, and I started missing home. Life was starting to feel cramped. You can probably intuit that down the left-hand side of the, the quilt. And I, I didn't know how to, how to chart a new course moving forward. And so it felt like I was stuck and trapped and looking into the future at some kind of idealized um, Garden of Eden, almost literally. I mean, it's in the last few years, I've gotten interested in farming and sustainable agriculture and food practices. So representing the future as an orchard for me felt very uh, of a piece. There's a tree for you. Now, I, didn't sew, I just recombined these. I didn't sew that piece. Someone did a real nice job with it though. The, I sewed down some glittery stuff as always. I got that piece of North Carolina fabric from someone in a workshop back in Winston-Salem. It's a nice old nod to home. The lemons, I'm not, going to get this, I'm not going to get the story exactly right, but it's worth telling. Because these lemons are a nod to Ms. Martha Stewart, who when Rosie O'Donnell interviews her, right when she first got out of prison, <laughs> Rosie asked Martha something like, what did you miss most while you were in prison? And she's standing under her lemon tree, apparently, is what she says, throwing a lemon in the air. The taste of lemon. And then she catches herself and says, my family. <laughs> <laughs> no shade on Miss Stewart, because she's a powerhouse, but I love that answer. So thinking about home and what we miss, I had to throw that fabric in there. This piece down the middle came from my partner's attic. They're cleaning it out. So that's a piece that used to be a lampshade when he was a, a small child. There it is up close. And then the last quilt, this is the homecoming quilt. And so with this one, you see a few things happening. You see bits and pieces of the other quilt tops, but now turned inside out. So in a minute, when I show you uh, detail shots, you'll be able to see that it's the same patchwork. Now we're just seeing the seam side, if you will. Um, and, and to me, what I was thinking about doing that was, this was a story of, moving through time, but it's also in a story of moving through place and how all of this changes us and turns us into different people on the other side, right? We're constantly changing, constantly growing. And so I wanted to show something about that turning inside out. Me personally, I feel that um, the life I'm living now is much more open and much more seen inside out than it was even back in 2008. So that felt appropriate. There's a giant medallion in the front I don't know. I, I feel like I've done some good things in the last decade, 15 years. I'm proud of that. And then to me, the most special part is the half on the bottom, which are a bunch of signature blocks. There's a close up of one for you. At one point in time, all, all of these blocks were in a quilt together. All these people knew each other. They might have been in the same Sunday school class or gardening club or book club or who knows. But then somebody cut them out of that quilt by the time I got to them. So I, I inherited these signature blocks as a bunch of separate pieces. So it seemed appropriate to me to pull them all back together, bring the gang back together again when thinking about homecoming. Here's a detail of a nice feed sack for you. The seam side. And thinking about quilting, this is the note that I'll wrap up on. I talked about how quilting the first one was hand tied. So that was an you know, excitement. And the second one was long-armed. I sent it to my partner's papa's girlfriend. Thank you, Connie, for long, to long-arm this machine, this quilt for me. She did a real nice job. And so to me, that felt like mm, getting it done. That was a phase of my life where I just needed to like head down, get it done. And now this latest quilt, this was all hand quilted, the work of many, many hands sitting around the quilting frame. I'd say at least two dozen people had help stitching on that quilt, which also felt appropriate to the story. So this is one of the many projects I made while I was at the folk school. And I'm, I'm super proud of it. I'm super happy with the way it turned out. There is, if you're interested, there's a full length video tour that I'll be posting on the Nook that was recorded the night of the opening. And so you can see the stories I couldn't tell because I couldn't interact with the quilt and the lifting and all that stuff. So if you're interested in that, you're on the Nook, check that out. I haven't posted it yet, but I will very, very soon. And with that, I'm gonna tap out turn back into a little square <laughs> and pass it over to Heidi. Thank y'all very much. Thanks, Zach. Yeah. Um, it's so special that I just got to see all three of your quilts in person and experience for myself, lifting up the veil and looking and 
you know, there's lifting up the veil also requires a certain amount of closeness. When we were teaching, a lot of times I would show a quilt and everyone would see it up close and then I'd scurry to the opposite side of the room and show it again and it would reveal something else. And I think it's interesting that in order to hold the veil, one is required to stay close to your quilts, which is very interesting feeling of homecoming as well. Yeah, it's hard to get the big picture, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah. yeah. All right, so um, here, here I am in my full safety outfit. Uh, so raincoat, net shirt that could unzip if I wanted to peek out, not through this lovely tool, and then my straw hat to protect me from the, <laughs> the elements. Uh, so definitely, um, you know, back back in the day, in my childhood, I was known affectionately by my family as indoor girl, and some things in this world don't change. So, I uh, um, I have spent a lot of time indoors in the summer, staying safe from bugs. Uh, this is another quote from my childhood, and you guys have seen it many times before. But I thought it would be fun to talk about applique today. Um, Joe and I made a collaborative quilt a while back, which you'll see, and that had a lot of applique in it. Uh, Joe was recently at my house here in Milwaukee, and we were talking mm -hmm. about applique and looking at quilts in person and kind of talking about what do you do on an internal corner. I like to do a whip stitch, and Joe was saying that that's how um, historically he's seen it done a lot as well. And when I was Googling how to do an internal corner, back in 2019, I saw a lot of tips with nail polish and glue and fusible. And I thought, oh, that sounds icky. I wouldn't like how that felt on my fingers. I do everything to avoid both bugs and glue and stickiness and textures that are unpleasant. So um, this quilt from my childhood has lots and lots of applique on it, which I think is a special starting point for why I like applique so much and what a quilt growing up, what an archetypal quilt looked like to me in my frame of reference, it was this one that was on my bed. It was also this quilt. Uh, it was a pre-printed thing, but my grandma applique a lot of trapunto on top of it with fabric and then also did some extra embroidery to embellish. This is the first quilt that I ever made and it's all pieced. And when I started making quilts, I focused a lot on piecing quilts. So using applique in my own work is something that emerged over time. My friend accidentally burnt a hole in this first quilt of mine that I loved very much. And I eventually, um, while I made it in 2013, it was either 2014 or 2015 that I appliqued this patch on it. So that's a little bit of early applique. Um, seeing this label, also I'm going to be doing a very exciting, I can't share all the details yet, but very, very exciting free conversation on Wednesday, June 29th at 5 p.m. Central. My newsletter, my email newsletter had a lie in it. It said it was at noon, but since then we've changed the time to 5 p.m. Central. So I'm sorry to those in Europe, but we will be talking about labels and doing some label stuff at that free event. So I'm also highlighting quite a few labels. Um, this is the third quilt that I ever made, lots of piecing, but this is the back of the quilt and I had, I didn't, no one taught me how to do binding. I was very much self-taught meandering in the world of quilting. So this is the back of the quilt and this flap here is the way that I did a self-binding quilt. You can see here at the edge that I wrapped everything around as I approached the edge and then I quilted it down and it was an interesting it also very very tricky to hide all of those big knots that I did with embroidery floss which I do not prefer to quilt with anymore <laughs> um, but here's a very special label um, this quilt that I made as a gift for my dad 
here's the other side of it. So it looks like a faced quilt because I wrapped that front around to the back applique style. This is maybe the sixth quilt that I ever made. It was in QuiltCon 2016, and it's the first one that had a significant amount of applique on it. Uh, it was done out of convenience, as much of my work is. Um, Zach knows I shared that with a lot of our students this past week when we were co-teaching. I'll talk a lot about what would be convenient, what would feel good to you. And I was still a high school art teacher at that time in 2014. I had a lot of final exams to proctor and big tests and things and cafeteria duty. So I would take these blocks of fabric and then embroider them or applique them while I was at school. And then I would come home in the evening and prep things and iron and pin, and then ultimately sew them together over the summer of 2014. Then there's a big gap in my applique life. I was doing a lot of machine piecing, but here I began to applique in 2016 with this series. Uh, it's the first entirely hand pieced quilt that I had ever made, except out of habit, I machine pieced the binding. Those little two inch suckers got a machine. And it was funny that I out of habit realized, wow, I can't say it's all hand done because like a robot, I used my machine. Uh, but that was a special one. And I was starting to feel like I was in a bit of a rut with the hand quilting that I was doing in terms of repeating the same shape or the same type of quilting over and over. So I did a big series of whole cloth quilts. This is one of them. And then I started doing a lot of layering similar to this piece that's always over my shoulder, um, fabric layered on the batting, then a transparent scrim of fabric on top and quilting everything down so that I could avoid the sewing machine, which was starting to hurt my back and my shoulder blade and made me feel too constrained sitting only in one place and listening to the sound of the sewing machine. I think it was more than anything, the sound of the sewing machine that drove me away from it because I wanted to be able to watch TV or talk or hear myself think. And then finally, here in 2018, I started to do a bit more thoughtful applique. I was working on this very small piece series, six inch framed quilts. And then I made these two pieces where I was looking back at the past, um, thinking about the passing of my dad on the left, and then on the right, thinking about the Heidi who used to be a high school art teacher and how she was no more and who was this new Heidi and what did the two Heidi's have in common and what was different about them and lots of um, all hand piecing in both of these quilts. This quilt, while it might look pieced, is just applique. There's one place where I've pieced a white piece of fabric to a blue piece of fabric right here along the midline. So the top has a blue background with applique on top of it. The bottom has a white background with applique on top of it. And it's a moment where my thinking was shifting a lot about applique and what you could do with it and how liberating and fun it is to make a curve and not have a mind game when you shift from mirrored, from pretty to pretty to opening it up, but to instead just make what you want to make and have it turn out exactly the way that you thought it would turn out. I wrote my scavenger hunt quilt pattern in 2019, and I was very excited to introduce that way of making. Uh, and then I, in 2020, made this quilt and I timed myself. I gave myself only three hours to hand piece a 40 inch quilt top. And it was a thrill to think about how can hand piecing be fast instead of slow. One of my favorite lines that a student quoted back to me during teaching last week on Madeline Island was when I said it's it's, it's someone, someone was saying something to the effect that you know, it's good to have fun too. You don't always have to be in a rush. And I said, it's fun to be fast. <laughs> so here I am really being strict with myself about just having three hours and thinking that that was really fun. You can also see at the top there's my laptop, I was watching a movie, I don't remember which one. And then I've got this small piece and that was my inspiration. So I never wasted time staring at the quilt top or deciding what to do. 
as I was piecing something, I was thinking and plotting my next move. And I love that idea that hand piecing is slow enough that it gives you the time and space and freedom to think of your next move while you're sewing. So here it is finished. The quilting took much, much, much longer than three hours. <laughs> and um, it was a exciting way to activate some of the more plain parts of the quilt. Here it is on display with some other work that is um, with no applique in it. All of this is a machine pieced quilt. And then these are both hand pieced, entirely hand pieced. I think so, yeah. <laughs> Uh, here's my quilt that I made with Joe. Uh, anyone who studied our work probably can identify who made which part, <laughs> like a nice signature. All of the, we were thinking about lost things and mending and gifting things. So all of the applique that I did on this quilt is in the shape that it was given to me in. Hilary Sprout, um, who's connected to Specs and Keeping, she gave me a bunch of fabric scraps back when I did the Have Company Artist Residency with Marley Grace in 2015. And I pulled those bits of applique out of the bag and I slapped them down to cover some stains that were on the quilt. And I love when Joe was giving a lecture to the Chicago Modern Quilt Guild and he pointed out that he thought this was an underwear. On. It wouldn't be the first time I put underwear on a quilt, Joe, but it was not intentionally underwear in this particular occasion. Uh, this is the other side of the quilt. The original maker, I imagine, intended this was the front. And so it was nice adding our marks on the back rather than distorting the front in a big way. But we did make it a tie quilt and added more ties to it in a variety of colors. And here again, part of my passion for labels. Uh, Joe sent me a picture of his signature so I could embroider it just so. And we were able to give tribute to the person who began the quilt. It was never bound, but it already needed some mending. And we signed it and it took us four, only four years to make this quilt, sending it back and forth to each other. <laughs> this is a quilt that I made traveling in India, full of applique. And I would say here I'm, I'm fully committed to being a lover of applique by 2019. I made this in 2020. Um, here's, again, this piece is hand pieced. And then this version is much more applique based and how I got the image to be the way it was. I also did a fair amount of machine piecing on this one. So combining those two techniques. This is a hand applique quilt. Also love this little bit of an embroidered label tribute in the middle. It says, uh, we've never met, but I've been an admirer. This is my quilt I made for the artist residency that I did, Art Servancy, lots of both embroidery and applique. Here's my uh, laptop case, lots of applique. This is just my little bit of a demo that I was doing for an online workshop. And lately I've been very excited about vases. I'm going to teach a vase workshop on Sunday, this week Sunday. So I've got a vase prepared with some batting around it. Um, this is a wine bottle that's prepared to become a vase. And a lot of this is an applique technique, but using applique in a more three-dimensional way. This is my most current quilt in progress. Lots and lots of applique, 365 applique circles. And just a little hint of how I like to use my embroidery hoop and also my iron. So large scale embroidery, or, uh, large scale applique, I like to use an iron and small scale applique, I like to use a hoop. Those are my preferred methods. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Heidi, that was neat to see the evolution of applique through your work over the years. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, in my mind, it's always been there. 
And mine too. I, it was funny thinking about what to share today and what would make sense. And it was um, took a minute to realize that it's I'm in an applique phase, perhaps. <laughs> All right, thank you. Over to Luke. All right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where everyone is. <laughs> um, share screen keynote, which Zach loves. and play. So I figured because uh, VVVIP Joe Cunningham was here today, I would talk about uh, some projects we've done, but also some inspiration from him, um, quilt, quilt collaboration. So I do a lot of collaborations with lots of different people because it helps me learn. It's my postgraduate uh, studies where I get to kind of um, literally work with masters of their trade and and sort of make an object together uh, this is one that joe and i did a long time ago i'm not as good at dates as heidi parks uh, i'm not even sure what date today is if, if it wasn't for zach telling me it was the first day of summer i'm not sure that i would know uh but so this was something that joe and i made at some point <laughs> um uh, and so obviously it's a picture of joe and i um I made the background, sent it to Joe. He cut it, fixed it, put it back together, put some wiggles on it, sent it back to me. I slapped Joe and I on top of it and quilted it. And there you go. So it gets to be this really great conversation of methodology and mark making and um, sort of fixing and, and, and mending and kind of literally collaborating on the object. Um, and I think it's just, it, it was so great. And obviously, as everyone knows, um, Joe's work, I mean, you know, obviously working with Heidi, but there's just this, this sort of dissemination of inspiration that comes from him and his work. And uh, so, you know, I'm certainly pleased to have collaborated with him a bunch in the past because I've been inspired constantly. Um, the, oh, here's, a, here's obviously another collaboration and maybe you'll recognize uh, a collaboration with Heidi Parks. Um, and I learned a bunch from the, one of the things that we did was sent each other some fabric to incorporate into, uh, sort of each other's side. So there's one side I did, one side she did, she got some of my fabric, I got some of her fabric, and then we both quilted it. So back and forth a couple of times that way to kind of, uh, both start the object and then finish the object. Neither of us knew what the other side was going to look like. And then once we saw it, we get to kind of resolve it a little bit with quilting or finish it or, you know, kind of combine the, the hand after you get to see it. And so you get this kind of like very dual, dual maker uh, in the object. And I think it really ended up pretty awesome. Here's one I did with Rachel Dore, a quilter in Bronxville, New York, so north of North of New York City, New York City. Um, I made the the double wedding ring and then she quilted it. Um, and she is a master quilter. Um, unfortunately, she can't make enough a year for her to continue to do every work that I make. So I only get her about every three years <laughs> to collaborate on one project. But um, you know, the, the quilting is just amazing and she's such a, a talented maker. Um, but you know, so I made basically a um, so it's all double wedding ring, um, all of the same fabric, um, and except for some of these indigo blue dye pieces that are just sort of scattered in. And then she came in with the quilting and sort of gave it this whole textural language. Uh, similar here, another collaboration with her, where I did the, the piecing with a, like four or five different slight tonalities of white and then some red. And it's just this traditional traditional quilt pattern that I changed which pieces that I used as, as the, the color accent. And then she came in and did all the quilting. So it got to be this really great collaboration between uh, me being interested in piecing and slight color and her being a master quilter, which is vastly outside of my skill set. <laughs> uh, and that's another thing about collaborating. Both you learn and also you can delegate sometimes. Here is a project uh, I did with Libs Elliot, um, where we both started with the same fabric and then uh, made a, a quilt sort of 
inspired by it. And you can see on Libs is a little bit better. It's that yellow polka dot on blue fabric was what we started with. I think we had two yards of it. Um, and then we each made a quilt incorporating it. So there's a very, a very different sense of how to um, honor that original fabric. In my case, I said, oh God, <laughs> how can I hide it as much as physically possible? So I incorporated it into um, a bunch of used clothing. So, I mean, there's probably 80, 90 different fabrics in the, mine is the one with the stripes on the left. Uh, and then incorporating some of these bits of the, the polka dot kind of in there. So you get this sort of duality. And then hers on the right, you can see she sort of went for it and honored some of the, the bigger panels of that same fabric. So it gets to be this really interesting because we didn't see each other's work until afterwards. Um, but you get to see kind of what fabric means to different makers and what that kind of thing is. So, you know, I'm really just such a fan of collaborating because um, it pushes you to do something, but it also allows you to see through someone else's eyes, if only for a small moment. If they're doing the same thing that you're doing, and it turns out very differently, obviously, um, they've thought about it differently. And I think that's just so enlightening. This is a collaboration with a Seattle painter. Um, she painted the white fabric and then sent it back to me, and I cut it up and sewed it into this other panel. Um, so it kind of gets to be this like way that I'm wanting to honor her color work while I'll give it space to talk. Her work is very cacophonous. So, uh, you know, my, I, I like to have a lot of kind of contemplative space in the work. So we got to kind of, you know, in this collaboration, I got to allow her the cacophony in this space of contemplation, which I think turned out pretty well. Another collaboration with a painter. This one is a lot more uh, painterly in some really awesome ways. Uh, she came in with just these great shapes and some colors and some spray paint. And, um, you know, you can see the quilt behind it was just this kind of um, simple block piece out of sheets. You know, there's some Mickey Mouse, there's some uh, vintage flowers, there's some... Um, cars and you know just florals and all these different kind of things and then uh, she came in painted these lines and then blocked out some of these areas kind of with that yellow and you know really having this great dialogue between um the the fabric and her painting um and i think that it just ended up being such an awesome piece because it gets to be you know a story of both of our works and again that's something i really appreciate about collaborating. I mean, it's one thing you see a lot of teachers use in their work, which is like, okay, I brought a bag of fabric that you would have never chosen. You better grab some uh, and then work with it or work against it or, you know, better yet, if you hate it. Uh, I had a drawing teacher in college who said, never use colors you like. Because if you use a color you like, you will fall in love with the color and then you don't have to do a good job. <laughs> Uh, she said, always draw with ugly colors, because if you can make a drawing that you like with something that you don't like, that means the drawing's what's important and not the colors what's important. Now, that, that's always stuck with me. Uh, that doesn't mean I use fabric I don't like, but, <laughs> you know, the idea of um, sometimes working with and against things that aren't right in your wheelhouse is a really great uh, challenge um, and opportunity. And I think collaborations allow that because not everyone's going to make the same choice. And so if you send someone something that they absolutely would not choose, it allows them a way to kind of fix it or um, add their own kind of story to, to kind of um, have a conversation with something they wouldn't choose. And I think that's so valuable. And I've got a couple more of the collaborations. A from... question asking the name of the painter in that oh. collaboration. Yeah, her name is Galen. And um, let me, uh, you know what? I'm going to stick her name in the, the chat because I'm not sure that I'm going to pronounce the, uh, the last name right because we mostly only talk via texting. Uh, so <laughs> uh, we've never met in person, which is pretty fun. Love the internet. So I'll put her name in the chat in just a minute um, for sure. Um, 
And then I've got a couple more projects that Joe and I have done over the years. I think I showed you all these when Joe and I had our show in uh, San Francisco, but well worth showing again now that we have Joe here. This one um, is a quilt. It's a quilt that I made, quilt top that I made. Um, it was white and red, and then I dunked the whole thing in indigo. And so the different kinds of fabric meant that it took the indigo in different ways. And then I sent that top to Joe and he put these birds on it, sort of alluding to the flying geese pattern that the, the quilt is made out of. And then I came and quilted it. And the, the gradient that you can see is actually all the quilting. So there's nine different colors of thread that kind of create this sunset vibe that the, the birds are flying into. Collaboration with Joe Cunningham, the Joe Cunningham. This one was some um, fabric that I brought back from Japan, um, kimonos. And then I made the top, sent it to Joe. I left a big hole out of it. So Joe filled it with some other fabric <laughs> and then put these awesome figures on it, sent it back to me. And I quilted it, trying to kind of keep some of this language of the, the fabric. And you can see some of those like swirly kind of wind patterns that I was going for in the quilting, kind of trying to reference some of the, 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 the floral and, and nature subtext to some of these amazing Japanese kimono silks. This one I dyed when I, I was trying to learn how to do indigo. So I made an indigo vat in the backyard and then dyed 300 yards of fabric um, because that's what you do when you're trying to learn something is you make 30 gallons of indigo dye and then you dye it. But what I did is I dyed all of it in the same vat. And so I got this gradient of color when the, de the vat started to reduce and dye. So this one was strips from lots of different pieces of fabric that became this gradient over time. Sent that to Joe and Joe made this, uh, I mean, shape experience, uh, sort of referencing uh, space time, uh, also referencing an onion bag. And you kind of get this like figure ground conversation uh, that where you get kind of that grid, but then the just like fully non-grid going on. So it's this really cool kind of, you know, in my mind, the simple background. And then Joe comes in with this kind of who's he what's uh, that you get to kind of have this great experience with and then hear him talk about kind of space time and all this stuff. You really get kind of this great um, experience with the object. But the other thing about this one is it holds really nice. I mean, it gets to be a quilt in some ways that some of the works that I put a big old person on it doesn't get to be. Because this one, you stick it on a bed, you fold it up, you flop it around. It still has the conversations that it has uh, when it's big and, and full on the wall. So I really like that one. And then one more I'll show you from, from old Joe and myself's collab over time. This was the latest one. I sent him this quilt top that I had been making, I just, I made it and then didn't know how to resolve it. It's all of these kind of reds and blues you can see kind of in that middle swath. Um, I just did not know how to resolve it. So what I do when I don't know how to resolve something is I send it to Joe <laughs> and he cuts it up and puts it back together and uh, does some crazy things with it and then send it back to me and I give it a quilt. So in this case, I send him that quilt top part shenanigans and he finished it with this sort of nod to uh, a Klimt painting and then put this kind of figure on with you know these these really great kind of um, line drawings that reference the painting and kind of finishing some of these edges of the quilt with these other fabrics and then I brought it back and quilted it with this um, trifoil pattern in the background the detail would be nice I don't have it <laughs> um, but you can kind of squint at it and see but this really cool kind of um, dialogue between um, Joe's method and then my method. And then again, so I didn't know what to do with the quilt top. I sent it to him. He probably didn't know what to do with the quilt top. So it got to be this collaboration of like, okay, how do I fix this mess that he sent me? And I think Joe did a great job of fixing the mess that I sent him. <laughs> um, so anyway, just, uh, just uh, can't, I cannot stress enough that collaborative efforts are, um, learning and growing and uh, enriching ways of engaging with your work and other people's work. Uh, 
Um, and Joe, if you want to go, it is your VIP time to go, ready to talk time. Make sure you unmute so we can hear you. Unmute. Ah. There I am. Am I unmuted? You yes. are, yes. You guys, it's hard to express how uh, technologically inept I am about all of this. Uh, I, I teach my monthly class, but I have a director for that who uh, he makes people panelists and he does things. Um, so uh, anyway, I don't have a, uh, uh, a digital presentation. It's just gonna be me carrying my laptop around and showing you stuff. Uh, I hope that's all right. Can do I get the screen there? Uh, Sounds awesome. I'm going to give you the full screen. All right. Um, let me see. Uh, uh, I, when I got started in 1979, the first thing that I learned how to do was to hand quilt. Uh, you know, here, how about if I make everybody seasick? I'm just trying to get this thing to uh, uh, cure. Was to hand quilt and. Um, uh, it was what I loved the most. It always has been, uh, is hand quilting. It's, uh, it, I don't know uh, how to, you know, you find what you like, just like uh, Heidi found applique and, and Zach has found working with old blocks and Luke has found what he does with imagery and stuff. Uh, but anyway, what, uh, when I, sat down and learned how to quilt, I knew this was what I wanted to do. Uh, and so I would go around to church groups and quilt with old ladies uh, at every opportunity. And I learned everything that I could. So I ended up writing books about, uh, at that time I was working with Gwen Marston and uh, we wrote books together about uh, quilting and hand quilting. Let me see here. I have a few of my old ones. They're mostly all gone, but I have a few uh, I thought what could be nice would be, uh, here's the last one that I did with Gwen, the very last quilt that we made together, uh, which uh, what I really liked about it is that we'd been making quilts for 11 or 12 years together at this point, and we were pretty good at it. And, uh, but we really liked just the simplest of simple things. Uh, and we'd done all kinds of complicated things, but we came back to uh, a nine patch for our last project. Uh, but this one has uh, uh, fancy dancy quilting uh, so that um, every square, every white square between the uh, black and white squares has its own design. Do those show up? That's all right? Yeah. Uh, oh, good. Um, so, it, you know, each one is a different, we got this, and then along the border is this tiny little feather. So the, the quilting at this time was uh, uh, largely an imitation of uh, 19th century, 18th and 19th century quilting styles. You, it was all about the tiny little stitches and the uh, old fashioned uh, patterns. So that was what I studied a lot was uh, feather designs, especially, uh, and cables and then ethnic styles, Amish styles. And uh, we did a lot of um, these kind of old fashioned uh, things. Here's one that's just, uh, uh, you can see Gwen's influence, if you know her work at all, in this applique border. Um, and then the quilting is just close and all over. You can see these triple uh, diagonal lines there, uh, I think, on the border. It's a lot of hand quilting, which if you like, the, the thing that people always say, always, universally, uh, about when they find out that you're a hand quilter, they say, oh, I would never have the patience, right? Uh, I'd never have the patience to do that because they don't understand that it doesn't take patience. Uh, if it's what you love to do, you never want it to end, right? 
<laughs> it's not patience. Amen. <laughs> yeah. So I've made a lot of, uh, at, a, at a certain point in my life, I was working in this kind of neoclassical style, I thought, where I was using classical patterns uh, and then uh, interpreting them freely. So here's one called uh, uh, Tree Everlasting. It's supposed to be just these very regular little triangles along the bars. And uh, I just did the triangles freehand to um, get this, this kind of effect. Did that show up there? Yeah. Um, and then I quilted different, there's I'm words. Even closer for the quilting. Uh-huh. Uh, here, let me see. And then hold real still. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Don't move. <gasps> Joe, it says your name. I can read it. Yeah. Um, and it says, it says uh, oh. Oh, right. It's, I forgot what it said. It says <laughs> Joe the Quilter. Uh, this I made for a musical show that I used to do, uh, telling the story of the real Joe the Quilter, who was born in 1750 in England. And so I wrote a musical about his life. And I used to go around and I had made uh, six quilts in Joe's style, more or less. Um, a real guy. Tell us a and, little more about him. Well, uh, he was born in 1750. Uh, he was a tailor, uh, trained as a tailor, who at some point, for some reason, uh, took up quilt making. Um, there was a common part in England <clears throat> of the tailor's craft. You had to learn how to make uh, uh, quilts. There was something that you sold. Because in England at that time, uh, quilt making was for the well-to-do. Uh, it was a commercial venture, you know. Um, so Joe was really good at it. Uh, some of his quilts are still extant. He was married for a while uh, and nursed his wife through a long uh, illness and then was a bachelor the rest of his life. Uh, lived to be 80 years old. And uh, the reason that we know about him is because uh, he was murdered in his own house by assailants unknown. It was an unsolved crime and uh, people suspected that it was because there was rumors that he had made himself rich through quilt making. You know how people do. Uh, <laughs> <I'm willing. laughs> yeah. And um, uh, um, so there was, uh, there was the ballad of Joe the Quilter was written and the wanted posters and all of that stuff. Um, and um, just recently, uh, uh, some of his quilts uh, are still in museums in uh, England, in Bath and other uh, places. But anyway, uh, recently archaeologists discovered the uh, foundation in the floor, the slate floor of Joe's cabin. They reconstructed it in, uh, uh, well, it's like this historical village in um, some town. <laughs> in Northern England that I want to go and visit. If you look up Joe the Quilter, it'll mostly be me, but if you look up Joe the Quilter's cottage, you'll find a really cool video about that. Thank you. So, Very cool to learn about. Um, so eventually my classes on hand quilting just petered out. Nobody was interested by the end of the 80s. Uh, the early 90s, because uh, domestic machine quilting and long arm quilting were taking over. And so uh, um, for a while, I just kept hand quilting, uh, like the, that blue and white one. And then I decided that as a responsible quilt professional, I should learn how to operate a long arm. So I started renting time on long arms. And then I heard that there was this computer operated long arm. And uh, what people were doing with this computer operated long arm was um, they were doing 19th century style quilting designs, just really <laughs> precise and robotic as if that was, and I tried to explain to people and I, and I finally came up with this idea that what I wanted to do was a whole cloth quilt quilted robotically that would look like a drawing, not look like uh, uh, a robot did it. I wanted to humanize the robot. 
And it's a long story, but I figured out this way to do it. And um, uh, eventually I got sponsored by Handy Quilter. They uh, gave me this computer operated machine so that I could continue my explorations. And that's what I've done ever since. Uh, here's one. Um, Joe, there. This is called Ox in the Woods. Um, th it's uh, done with um, cleaning rags from a friend of mine who sends them to me he, when he cleans off his printing press. He sends me uh, cleaning rags. And the quilting is a picture of the woods that I transcribed into my computer. You can see uh, some of the branches and leaves and the craziness. Oh, wow. There. Beautiful. Showing um, up really well on my screen, too. Oh, good. Oh, good. Right? Uh, the, the last year was the year of the ox. And I thought, if I was that ox, where would I be? I would be in the woods. And here's one that I used the computer for uh, called uh, Monument to Discarded Love. Um, also has some of John's, uh, John Pappas's uh, uh, discarded uh, rags from his printing press. Um, and the quilting on it is uh, something I wanted to do as soon as I heard about computerized quilting, which is it's two stacks of cars, uh, squa crushed cars like at a junkyard. Can you see the grill there on the beamer? Yeah, yeah. Keep oh, good. It still. Um, so it's all different cards. There's a Lincoln above that. Um, there's these unidentifiable things, the Corvair down here. And then in the middle are uh, discarded tires. Um, oh, yeah. Be really, really still right there. Those look good. Yes, with the black one. Yeah. Uh, so um, when I am using the uh, um, computer, what I'm trying to do, like I say, is to not look robotic, but to look uh, the way I want it to. This one is a quilt that I made recently, um, and it's, uh, I don't think it really has a name yet, uh, but what, uh, because of people making quilting, making clothes out of old quilts, I decided, well, maybe somebody will want to make a, a, a coat out of my new quilt. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and so I had a, a clothing designer uh, lay out a, a, a coat pattern on here. You can see um, here is the back of the uh, coat. Does that show up? Oh, that is a brilliant idea. Yeah. And then uh, here is, uh, you know, the left, the left front and the right front up above it and so on. So very soon here. Uh, I'm going to make a video and have uh, Connie show me how to cut it up. Connie Walkershaw, the designer. And uh, then I'm going to hire her to sew it together because tailoring is not my forte. So you will really make a quilt, a coat out of that? I, I'm going to, yeah. I would uh, one just the way it is, too. I mean, it's well, a great commentary on the current conversation about quilts or quotes or... I, I I thought it was really really funny, and yeah, then and when I explained it to my wife, uh, when I, I, I explained it to my wife, she said, "Oh, oh, and and that's funny somehow." I said, "Yeah, <laughs> yes. see see it's funny. It's super funny." Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Here's a quilt. I was supposed to be in Kiev, in Kiev, uh, Ukraine right now. Uh, uh, this is a quilt that I made a while ago called The Sleeping Protesters of Kiev about the revolution in 2014. Um, I wanted to make a blanket for those protesters sleeping in the government buildings. And I met some artists when I had a show in Italy uh, from Kiev, and they arranged for me to have a show at the Museum of History and Modern Art and it got put off in 2020 and put off in 2021 and uh i was supposed to go in june of 2022 um and someday i'm going to take this quilt and uh, i'll deliver it to the museum and donate it 
to them. And one more, I'm doing a, a, a series of quilts about um, called, uh, three, three quilts called Mariupol. And they all have uh, birds, uh, big, big or small black birds on them. This is quilt number three. And um, I decided to uh, program some Ukrainian Easter eggs uh, for the quilting design. So that's what I'm having my robot quilt all over it. Oh, that's neat. We just got a question as well from Victoria asking if you still do some hand quilting. Uh, here's a quilt um, called uh, Two Party System. It's, uh, it's it, it, and since it was about uh, our two party system, I hand quilted it with a jungle all over it. Let me see if that shows up. Yeah, hold can, still. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. You can see all of these designs. Yes. Uh, and um, uh, yes, so these big leaves and everything. Uh, and I quilted it in the modern style with, uh, instead of little tiny stitches, with big, uh, um, you know, uh, embroidery floss. Or, uh, yeah stitches. And then I noticed only when I was quilting it that there were these, I had missed these little moth holes in this wool fabric. So I embroidered over them with the quilting, the stuff that I was quilting with. And um, mm. yeah. So yes, I do. I hand, I hand quilt about one a year, more or less. Thank you, Joe. You're welcome. Oh, that's awesome. I'm going to add the three of us back so we can have a conversation. Oh, good. Now I get to sit down. <laughs> you can relax a little. You've got a good view behind you, too. Yeah. Good. I'll just say that as someone who is less familiar with your work out of the four of us. It was such a treat to see just mm. a broad swath from the mm. stuff you were doing in the 80s, 90s, up until yeah. um, most recently. Thank you. For Good. That. Yeah. 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 Uh, see what's been what's on the wall. You've been you've been busy. Uh, well, uh, I, I, I have. I didn't feel very creative during the uh, lockdown years, I, but I kept working. I kept coming to work and making stuff. Mm -hmm. stuff mm -hmm. so uh um yeah i have but this one behind me is from 2017 i think it's called uh, after the glacier uh, we yeah. have a question from laura brown asking can you tell us about how you make the lines in your compositions like in the collaborative quilts you made with heidi and luke not quilting the lines but yeah, lines of fat. I know part uh, of the answer is bias tape. That's the whole answer. I, I, I use <laughs> uh, at, at one point I stumbled on the idea of scribbling on a quilt top with bias tape. Um, I really liked that one quilt that Luke showed. Uh, that's the uh, the two of us standing there with that black squiggle on the left. And uh, I think if I understood the story correctly, uh, somebody said uh well that can't be by joe he does a lot better than that but, <laughs> but, but it's, it's it's by me uh, uh, I, I love scribbling like that um and so it's funny that none of them that i showed here have bias tape but i i just use a lot of i make bias tape and i buy it and i'm people because they found out or because i advertised that i use bias tape uh, Oh, I know what happened. The first time that I made a quilt and I scribbled all over half of it with bias tape, I took it over to, to my friends, the hand quilting group at the church near my house called uh, the Dorcas Quilters. Um, they're just wonderful. And at that time, the leader, Bonnie, uh, they all claimed to enjoy it. And Bonnie said, oh, Joe, if you're going to use bias tape, you should uh, put that on your website because all us old ladies, we got a drawer full of that in our sewing room and we don't use it anymore. <laughs> And I said, all right. And I put that up on my website that I was looking for bias tape. And here's my address. 
I got so much bias tape in one month, I had to take it down. People from <laughs> Germany and Mexico and Canada, all over this country. Uh, and so people still send me envelopes full of uh, bias tape, very often with the uh, uh, a little note that says, I was cleaning out my mom's sewing room and I thought you might like this. So uh, uh, just real quickly, I could show right here is one that I didn't look at. Uh, this, this is a quilt called rest i made it in 2020 about needing a place to rest from all the insanity so i stole uh, van gogh's chair and uh, made this quilt about it and then i quilted it real closely with uh, an aerial photograph of the iowa farmscape but anyway um, you can see this uh, sort of cloud of bias tape is the sort of thing that i like to do this is half inch bias that I made out of some hand dyed fabric. And then uh, I often also will make a cloud of sticks like this. Um, uh, these are just quarter inch white bias that I just cut into, you know, convenient lengths and sew them down and to make a cloud with those. Does it show up? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. So, and the way I do it, I just. Uh, I sew down one side and then I sew down the other uh, with a matching thread and a simple top stitch. Nothing complicated. Do you um, always just sew it down or do you ever pin it in advance or make a mark and then follow that mark? Uh, I once, uh, uh, the quilt is gone now, but I once did a portrait of Luke Haynes uh, in bias tape and um, uh, if I'm going to be doing a specific line like that, I don't pin it or glue it because in my experience, sewing it by machine at least, um, there soon becomes a differential between the, the backing and the bias and I have to unglue, I have to unbaste, unpin. So I do always do it freehand, but like when I did a portrait of Luke and other things when I need a specific line, I will draw it with chalk and I just follow the chalk line. Mm -hmm. My studio here is straight on Market Street, and so there's a guy that walks by with his boombox with Jimi Hendrix blasting. <laughs> a couple, two or three times a, a day. Violin. That's yeah, yeah, no, it was <laughs> Hendrix. <laughs> um, uh, Sally asked if anyone's do any of us are doing a show in the UK anytime soon, and I I don't have one signed up unfortunately. I don't know if either any of y'all do. They want to. I do, would love to. Go. Yeah. Yeah, T tell your favorite local museum that we would like to do a show with them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we've got work for them. If they've got walls, we've got work. Yeah. <laughs> I just applied for, for the show in, in uh, France for next year. Uh, I would like to. I, I've never done that one. Oh, wait, wait, the, wait. The, the patchwork, the European patchwork show? I think that's right, yeah. I've done it a couple of times. It is a wonderful experience to go. You're just like nestled in these beautiful mountains and there's just quilts pinned to every surface. Oh, looking forward to it. So one of the um, uh, chat questions, I was just reading through those and there was a question for you, Joe, about whether like, just talk a little bit more about your influences from current events. I mean, there's, uh, the question was how much of your work, but I think just sort of expanding on that question, I think there's, there's a lot to be said about using quilts, quilts, you know, these old grandma things that we, you know, don't find valuable and that we just, you know, blah, blah, blah. There's this sort of uh, quilts as, you know, aren't valued and blah, you know, there's just so much about quilts that have these, these sort of unfortunate stories to them, right? Like, you know, they're mm -hmm. just for youth and they're blah, blah, blah. But then if you use them as this foundation for a conversation about current events, you're like really mm -hmm. turning on its head these um, misconceptions about quilts as they're, you know, they're sort of like basic objects and, you know, kind of in, in a domestic, a private domestic sphere exclusive. But like, can you talk a little bit about that? Like using, using something that, that's, whose language is thought to be very understood, like quilting. And obviously none of us here, you know, this whole community of here talking and, and listening aren't sort of folks who have those preconceptions, but like as a medium, yeah. it certainly has a lot of, of things that 
it becomes our job to to recontextualize and you're i mean you know you're you're doing that mm -hmm. with <laughs> with sort of uh you know mm -hmm. sit-ins and crushed cars and all of these different ways of, of re-understanding it we can talk yeah about so uh very early on um when i first started learning how to make quilts uh, i didn't really uh know what i was doing until 25 years later, uh, uh, at least 20 years later, I didn't realize that I had always wanted to be an artist. All I cared about was art from the time I was born and could read, uh, uh, I was art. I would, uh, I would skip school to go to the museum, for instance, and that sort of thing. But my high school teacher uh, told me, and it was not Heidi, uh, explained to me I had no talent for this. I, uh, the, 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 uh, Joe, your drawings and your sculpture and all that stuff, it's just not you. you that's not any good. But I was a guitar player, and I went to work uh, playing professionally for years. And I didn't worry about it, about becoming an artist, because I was one, right? I'm, I'm a guitar player. But uh, uh, when I took up quilts, um, it was, there's the Hendrix guy again. When I took up quilts, um, uh, what I, I realized that what I did was I backed myself into uh, becoming an artist without ever um, having to make the commitment. Making a, making a quilt was so unintimidating, right? Your, your grandma made quilts, your aunt made quilts. So, you, you know, I had female relatives that made quilts. My mom made quilts. How hard is it? They, don't, they didn't go to art school. They don't know. I mean, quilts, it, it looks kind of like art, you know, uh, but uh, it's not as intimidating. I don't, I don't have to say that I'm an artist. I don't have to say that I'm trying to be an artist even. But I only realized in retrospect that all the time when I started making quilts, I was making quilts. <laughs> even when I was... Uh, um, uh, copying old quilts, stitch for stitch. I saw it as a conceptual uh, uh, piece. I, I don't know how to make it any more clear than that. But at a certain point, I, I just gave all that up. I realized, uh, it, Joe, if you want to honor, which is, this was my goal, was to honor the women of the 19th century uh, America that I revered their, them and their work. It, if I wanted to honor them truly, what I should do is what they did was to follow my own heart and to do what was in my heart, what was in myself, you know. And at that point, probably 15 or 18 years ago, I just started making uh, stuff that I wanted to make. And it turns out that what I want to make is stuff largely about disasters and <laughs> and um, uh, uh, the the environment and um, oh, I don't know. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, but. When I'm making a quilt now, let me see. What I learned how to do uh, in uh, 1979 and 80, what I learned how to do was to make blankets, to make a to make a, a quilt that you could wrap up in on the sofa, put it on the bed, right? That's what I'm still doing. I'm a quilt maker. Uh, I, uh, I, I've noticed that many people, when they start making art, uh, with quilts, they stop making quilts and they're making art instead. So my idea has been for me, I want to make quilts that are art. I can do both at the same time. So my quilt, which I'll charge you like $10,000 for, could be used on your bed. Uh, and I hope it looks good enough that it will go on the wall of a museum and look at home. That's my goal here. Subject matter um, is what I... It, 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 it's it's the hanger that I hang my quilt on is subject matter. I start out with an idea, not a pattern. When I start out a quilt, I don't know what it's going to look like. I, I don't make drawings or anything. So I don't know what the quilt's going to look like when I start out. I just know what it's going to be about. And for me, uh, making my quilt is not a means of communication. I'm not trying to communicate anything. Uh, I'm only trying to express uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to express what's inside me. That's just all I have is me. That's all any of us have, you know. 
there's always hotshot applique artists that are 10 times better than me. I'm talking about you, Heidi. Uh, 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 there, there's always these, these young people that are a lot better than you at uh, what you're trying to do. All we have is our uniqueness, you know, and so I'm just trying to let that come out into the world. And um, what people take away from it is uh, their business. Does that address the question? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the, I mean that. So, like, we're called. You know, the this this series of talks is called soft bulk. I mean, the whole thing is based on uh, quilts remaining objects, uh, and you know, the, uh, quilts as as physical space holders. I mean, that's really where this conversation started, and so we're we're right mm. there with you. And certainly, that doesn't that doesn't um, specify scale and it doesn't specify utility, um, but it allows for utility, scale, history, function, mm. um, art. I mean, there's, there's all of these components that quilting have in them that I think um, uh, forget to get mentioned when as soon as you as soon as you capitalize the art word, you have to stick it on a wall and pretend it's a painting. And I feel like mm -hmm. there's some of the, the important language about quilting that we pretend isn't there in order to sell it for enough money to feed ourselves, right? But we'll right. think right. it's there. And, and I think you're exactly right. And I think, you know, especially with this this group here, I mean, we- Yeah, uh, you especially. Know, mm -hmm, like the, the, you know, Heidi's tactility about sort of like the physical act of making, using like literal parts of her life in ways that she's willing to touch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like that's 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 so interesting. You know, that that's not painting, right? Like just like putting a big old picture on a as big a yeah. camp as the MoMA will buy is just a different conversation than um, you know building something out of something that you're just you have to touch for <laughs> your life and sort of can't not. And yeah, yeah. The, uh, um, the, there's there is a real generational component here too. I mean, I love. Uh, what's happening with you three uh, and other people in your generation is that uh, uh, for a long time, I felt like uh, art quilters, the majority of art quilters of my generation, the people that wanted desperately to be seen seriously as artists, never went to the museum. They, they, they didn't have a real relationship to the possibilities of art and uh, didn't base anything um, uh, that they were doing. Uh, they, uh, I always felt that art quilters, um, well, what we did since, uh, is it okay for me to keep talking for a minute? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm very curious about what, it. What, what we did uh, was that um, the art world from early on, since quilts were extra academic, they were made by untrained women, they were not uh, in any recognized art uh, medium, uh, they were excluded from the world of art. And they were excluded in the 1800s, they were excluded in the 1900s, uh, and they're being less excluded now. But uh, so art quilters starting in the 70s, with this uh, uh, current age that we're in that started in the 70s, art quilters um, built themselves a ghetto. We, we built uh, uh, the, our own galleries. We had our own exhibitions. We had our own annual big shows. And we learned to make quilts that could compete in those with our uh, self-referential um, aesthetic uh, standards, you know, and standards and mores. and uh, so we build our own world um, and it's cool. This been, it, it's my privilege to be part of that world, you know? Um, but uh, you can win Houston, uh, Visions, Quilt National, Paducah, and all of them and take your trophies and ribbons into the curator's office and slap them down on the desk and it has no impact. There's no, there's no relationship between quilt art and art art, you know? And so um, uh, so that's what I'm trying to do is um, a little bit. Uh, it, it's, it's too big of a lift for me. But, uh, but anyway, that's what I felt for a long time uh, was that not enough quilters um, paid attention to the world of art. 
you three are highly educated people that know a lot about the world of art and you're taking these the concepts and following your own muse each each one of you and uh it's things and so you're making these sophisticated statements which is uh uh glorious to me uh that that things are finally um changing and people going way beyond me which i really like something that you referenced that resonates with me a lot is that you thought you were making one thing and actually you're making something else so you're making multiple things mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. i've been sitting here the whole time working on a scrap quilt these are scraps from when i was mending somebody's scarf so I do use this transparent white and then I mm -hmm. backed it and turned the edge and finished it. And then I, I ended up, I mended the scarf. I mailed it off to New York. They've got their scarf, but I also have these two very long strips of transparent silk fabric that is a remnant from having made the scarf. And right now I'm working on the third piece in a series of white scrap quilts that I'm making that are just finding all these bits that are left from I, when I thought I was making something. Yeah. I was yeah. also at the same time making these scraps. That's a lot of what these vases that I'm doing are about yeah. too. I thought I was <laughs> basting a quilt and quilting a quilt and binding, but lo and behold, I was also making every time I make a quilt, yeah. a 25 fit, foot by two inch scrap of cotton batting and like what to do with that i find to yeah. be just you know very interesting and for me it's it's taken and halfway through piecing this third quilt and just thinking a lot about what a potentially big idea that is that in making these scrap quilts for me i think it's really you know interesting that they i happen to have a lot of white fabric scraps and mm -hmm. how that maybe even references whiteness and my ability to go and do things without thinking about the ripple effect and to then mm -hmm. go back and figure out like what else was i doing at the same time when i was calling myself a quilter or an art quilter or a, a textile artist or a regular artist um yeah. I can think back to when I was a teacher and I thought I was teaching high school art but I was actually getting amazing practice for a new career where I had to be in front of people and talking and right. presenting with some charisma. And, you know, if, if you can entertain 14 year olds <laughs> all day, every day, right. it's real good training for, for other things. But that, um, you know, that idea of looking back and saying, what, what were you doing? You thought you were creating an art quilt world but in fact it was this separate but not quite equal space mm -hmm. that was created mm -hmm. yeah um so something else occurs to me uh, uh thinking about the generational difference when i got started in the late 70s uh it was all about reproducing uh the finest of 19th century style quilts so it was all about symmetry it was about uh technical precision and and uh it was it, it, it was all about the pattern and all that sort of stuff many people of the last 20 years that got interested in quilts uh it seems to me their first exposure to the, what a quilt could be was the g's bend quilts and so it was uh yeah and so instead of this like cage of the tradition that was, I, I think, completely misunderstood what the tradition really was. The tradition has all the freedom in it. Instead of that, it was the G's Bend quilts and quilters who uh, uh, brought, who conveyed the idea that quilts uh, were freedom. Quilts were a way to be free. And um, so, uh, our quilt culture has changed, um, uh, you know, tr tremendously as a result, much for the better, I think. I've been to G's Bend a number of times and quilting with the 
women there and becoming friends with them. And uh, it has been like the privilege of my life. It's like going to the Beatles house, you know. Uh, uh, it's the closest I'll ever come. The, uh, uh, my friend Rabbit down there, she quilts on a frame that her great granddad made the sawhorses. And uh, she, and it's, it's like uh, 19th century style. I can sit there and quilt with her and just feel uh, it's the greatest. Yeah, and I, I think so important to keep mentioning again and again how important the quilts of Jeans Bend are, the many, many world contributions to quilting. Yeah. Uh, you know, for me, that white quilt that I made, the first one that was hand pieced, that was very inspired by my trip to Korea, which, you know, I've talked about many times before, and I was trying to keep it to 10 minutes, so I didn't mention it. Yeah, before, yeah. But, um, yeah, I, I went to Korea and I learned about Korean patchwork and the whip stitch yeah. and the idea that you could visibly hand piece something mm -hmm. instead of invisibly hand piece something. And yeah. it, it blew me away. It was the most exciting idea I think I've ever heard. And yeah. uh, re really yeah. to just keep keep opening our eyes and keep realizing I thought one thing was happening. I was on board for that, but maybe it's bigger than I first thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and you do. Yeah, yeah. In, you know, in in your lecture where you were sharing about how women have always been doing what they wanted and not just following a pattern and and been creative for a long time. That it's not this new, mind-boggling idea that you can make a quilt and it can be your own creative thing. Uh, is such yeah. a message too. Yeah, the the tradition always contained that uh, you know, that possibility. Uh, people are talking in the chat. I see. I just pulled the chat up, and I, uh, yes, Faith Ringgold. Uh, I live in San Francisco, and so uh, uh, in I think July nineteenth, the Faith Ringgold show is going to open here at the De Young. I'm very much looking forward to that. Yeah. She's I was in her treasure. presence for about 30 seconds as she mm. like walked into a limo. <laughs> and I had goosebumps. Yeah, yeah. I that met her many years ago. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, she's something else. Yeah. Well, we've well, Joe, we can... been ending around 90 minutes. I wonder if this is our 90 minute moment or if we have one more thing we want to dig into or share. I think we've had all the questions in the chat. I've been keeping an eye on that. Good. I can I can talk to Joe all the time, anytime <laughs> for as long as possible. So I that's won't true. You just give me a call. Any <laughs> of y'all, just Listen. give me a call. <laughs> um, this has been great. Thanks everyone for coming. Thanks everyone for watching. Thanks Joe, obviously for for sharing and uh, making some time. If anyone has any more questions, there's going to be. Uh, links in the YouTube down below for Joe's contact information. Our contact information will be there. You're obviously welcome to reach out. Um, and, you know, we all teach, we all show. If you know of some venues, um, we would all love to teach and show at them. So uh, <laughs> please to, to, to reach out um, uh, to us uh, individually or as a group or however, however, you know, feeds your soul. We're here to, to give back uh, for a nominal fee. <laughs> thank you so much for your time yeah and the youtube it's it's on my youtube channel so youtube.com backslash heidi parks and comment in there you can keep the conversation going you can add links to interesting things in the comments there um, like and subscribe and then share with a friend who might be interested in the conversation but thank you everyone very much Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Hi, y'all. Bye-bye.